how do you, as a white South African, approach writing a story like this? Do you ever have any moments of crisis or self-doubt? Well, I think it's extremely important that I, I never claim to speak for anybody else and that I write the book as self-consciously as possible as a white South African through my perspective and uh, not pretending to adopt another. At the same time, I, I do think that it is very important for South Africans to attempt to tell one another's stories because in telling someone else's story, one has to take an imaginative leap and try to inhabit them. And, and that's a very important exercise. I think that if we abandon that attempt, if we stop doing that, a common public space breaks down in this country and we retreat into our respective ghettos um, and become more and more estranged. And so it is very important never to assume to speak for somebody else, but it's equally important to try and imagine being somebody else. It's, it's very important to the integrity of, of this country um, and our common life. So this book shines a light on a dysfunctional justice system. This did happen pre-1994, but I'd like to get your take on the current justice system. Do you think this sort of thing could still be happening? Well, well I think the book shows that it is happening. Uh, you know, the book begins in 1992 and, and the trial takes place under apartheid and it's very much an apartheid trial. You know, this is a trial where the judge uh, calls black witnesses by their first names. When he's talking to black witnesses about white people, he says, Bas Sobody or Madam Sobody. It, and it, it's staggering to actually read the text. Um, and yet the story goes on into the new dispensation and the injustice continues. Um, and some of the injustice is not about law. It's about the way people are treated despite law. You know, Fusi and Tukolo were, were given legal aid. They had two advocates working for them. Both of those advocates let them down terribly and did so because they were poor, insignificant people. They didn't matter and they had no recourse. And that happened to them again and again. It happened to them at the Truth Commission. It happened to them when they attempted to alert the Justice Department to what had happened. They, they were nobody. Uh, and, and that's the continuity between apartheid and now. They remained insignificant people. And, and that's why injustice was such terrible injustice was committed against them. You write in the book, and I'd like to quote, I had it in mind that we'd forgotten what had changed and what had not since the end of apartheid, that it would take an insurmountable effort to distinguish the old from the new. So what in your mind hasn't changed? Well, one thing that hasn't changed enough um, is what happens to families like uh, Tsukolos and Fusis, not just themselves, but their families. You know, you can trace back generations to the early 20th century. Those people have been treated like dirt consistently. Uh, Fusi's grandparents and great-grandparents were labor tenants on white-owned farms with no rights at all. Um, there's a story in Fusi's family of an uncle who fell and broke his arm. And as a result, the entire family was evicted overnight from their property. This is run-of-the-mill normal events for families like this. And that neglect of human beings and of those particular human beings did not stop with the transition to democracy. While Fusi and Sokolo were in jail, facing their own particular injustice, something was happening to their families on the outside. They were being evicted en masse uh, from the farmland that they'd occupied, in Fusi's case, for six generations. And so there's this strange parallel happening. There's Fusi and Sokolo on the inside. Um, and in the outside, uh, something in a way equally dark is happening to their families. Um, it started happening under apartheid, but it just continued happening after the end of apartheid. Uh, and those continuities are quite chilling. You know, the, the story is that if you were marginal and treated badly 100 years ago, you still are today, despite the transition to democracy. Right now in South Africa, the country appears to be burning. In your opinion, where have we gone wrong? You know, I, I don't think the country is burning. I, I think it has terrible problems, and these last couple of weeks have been awful. Um, but I, I don't see us as a country that is falling apart. Um, you know, we have gone wrong in many ways. The inequalities are staggering in this country. Um, both the white and the black elites, I think, have been serving themselves. Um, and tend to blame one another rather than to introspect. Um, but I don't think that we are standing on the edge of an abyss. 
um, you know, I think that a great deal of pain can and does happen and a country lives on. Um, and that's both good and it's a tragedy that so much pain can be um, withstood. What do we do to fix this? To fix the, the general problem as a whole? Well, it's at the a big moment question. we're sitting with xenophobia and femicide being very topical. Um, yeah. That's people are protesting over the scourge of gender-based violence and they're, I mean, then we've got these attacks that appear to be some of them at least xenophobic in nature. Yeah. You know, I, th I think that there, in, in a way, there's a, a link to what happens, uh, on the one hand, to what happened to Fusi and to Kolo, um, and the xenophobic violence and the gender-based violence. And, and that is a, a set of institutions that are not doing their job. Um, in Fusi and Sokolo's case, um, a justice system literally rendered them invisible. They could shout as loud as they liked. It didn't matter. They didn't matter. Part of what's fueling the xenophobic violence is the fact that the institutions that should be holding and nurturing ordinary people are just not there. Um, and many people are organizing themselves into parallel institutions uh, with different agendas. And I think that's one of the things that was behind the xenophobic violence um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, just a sense that nobody is in control um, and other forms of control coming in to substitute. Um, you know, we had 10 years in this country where we had a president who paid no heed to institutions at all. Um, and, and we're really suffering the consequences dearly. Mm -hmm.